Hi guys, I'm back for chapter three. If I'm talking funny, sorry, I'm wearing my retainer. Straight teeth, discipline, it hurts, but it's okay. Oops. Okay, chapter three, the world's greatest dinosaur war ever. I couldn't believe it. The door opened in the middle of the math class and the principal pushed the older raggedy kid in. Mrs. Cordell said, boys and girls, we have a new student in our class starting today. His name is Rufus Fry. Now I know all of you will help make Rufus feel welcome, won't you? Someone sniggled. Good. Rufus, say hello to your new classmates, please. He didn't smile or wave or anything. He just looked down and said real quiet, hi. A couple of the girls thought he was cute because they said, hi, Rufus. Why don't you sit next to Kenny and he can help you catch up with what we're doing, Mrs. Cordell said. I couldn't believe it. I wanted my personal saver to be as far away from me as he could get. I knew when you had two people who were going to get teased a lot and they were close together, people didn't choose one of them to tease. They picked on both of them. And instead of picking on them the normal amount, they picked on them twice as much. Mrs. Cordell pushed a new kid over to the empty seat next to me. Kenny, show Rufus where, we're in, where we are in the book. I watched the new kid sideways. He said, Kenny, I thought they said your name was Poindexter. The class cracked up, part from his country style of talking and part from laughing at me. I could tell that even Mrs. Cordell was fighting not to break out laughing. Though he was looking friendly when he said this, I kind of knew it had to be teasing because whoever heard of anybody's mama giving them a name like Poindexter? When he sat now next to me, I tried to imitate Byron's death stare, but it didn't work because the kid smiled at me real big and said, my name's Rufus. What are we doing? Times tables. That's easy. You need some help? No, I said, and scooted around my chair so all he could do was look at my back. This guy was real desperate for a friend because even though I wouldn't say much back to him, he kept jabbering away at me all through class. When lunchtime came, he followed me outside right to the part of the playground where I sit to eat. He forgot about bringing lunch, so I gave him one of Mama's throat-choking peanut butter sandwiches and let him eat the last half of my apple. He really was a strange kid. He only ate half the sandwich and folded the rest up in wax paper, and when I handed him the apple, he even ate the spots where you could see my teeth had been. He didn't even wipe the slob off first. And man, this kid could really talk. He was yakking a mile a minute, saying stuff like, your mama sure can make a good peanut butter sandwich. And how come these kids are so darn mean? Then he said something that made me get all funny and nervous inside. He said, how come your eyes ain't looking in the same way? I looked to see if maybe this was start of some teasing, but he looked like he really wanted to know. He wasn't staring at me either. He was kind of looking down and kicking at the dirt with his raggedy shoes. It's a lazy eye. He stopped kicking dirt and said, don't it hurt? No. He said, oh, then kicked a little more dirt and hollered out, oh boy, look at how fat that there is. What? Don't you see that squirrel? He asked me and pointed up at the tree across the street. That sure is one fat, dumb squirrel. I looked at the squirrel. It didn't look fat or dumb to me. It was a regular old squirrel sitting in a branch chewing on something. How come you think it's dumb? What kind of squirrel sits out in the open like that with folks all around him? That squirrel wouldn't last two seconds in Arkansas. I'd have picked him off easy as nothing. Then the new kid pointed at the squirrel like his finger was a gun and said, Bang! Squirrel stew tonight. You mean you shot a gun before? Ain't you? You mean you really ate a squirrel before? You ain't? A real, real gun? Just a twenty-two. How's a squirrel taste? It tastes real good. You mean you really shoot him with real bullets and then you really eat them? Why I'll shoot him. Real squirrels like that one? Not that fat and not that stupid. I guess all the fat, stupid ones have been got already. Since I've been born, all that's left in Arkansas. Skinny, sneaky ones. I think them Michigan squirrels is worth two Arkansas ones. You aren't lying. He raised his hand and said, I swear for God, ask Cody. Who? The little shrunk up version of the new kid was standing by himself up against the fence that runs around Clark watching us. The new kid waved at him. His little brother came running over. The big one pointed over at the squirrel. Cody, look at there. Cody laughed and said, oh boy, that sure is a fat squirrel. Think you could pick him off from here? Cody pointed his finger like it was a gun and said, bang, squirrel stew tonight. I couldn't believe this little kid has shot a gun too. You shot a real gun? Just a 22? With real bullets? The little one looked at his big brother to see why I was asking all this stuff. It seemed like they were trying to be patient with me, like I was real dumb or something. The older one said, tell him. 
yeah, it was real bullets. What else are you going to shoot out of a gun? I still didn't believe them, but the bell rang and lunch was over. I know he didn't think I noticed, but the big kid gave his little brother the other half of my sandwich. I guess both of them had forgot about lunch. The saver stuff wasn't going anything like I thought it was supposed to. Rufus started acting like I was his friend. In the morning on the bus, he'd always come sit next to me, and Mrs. Cordell put his regular seat next to mine in school. Every day at lunch, he followed me out to the playground and ate half of my second sandwich, then sneaked the other half to Cody. He even found out where we lived and started coming over every night around 5.30. I didn't mind him coming over to play because both our favorite games was playing with the little plastic dinosaurs that I had, and you couldn't really have any fun playing by yourself. That was because someone had to be the American dinosaurs and someone had to be the Nazi ones. Rufus didn't even mind being the Nazi dinosaurs most of the time, and it was okay playing with him because he didn't cheat and didn't try to steal my plastic monsters. The only other guy I used to play with was LJ Jones, but I quit playing with him when a lot of my dinosaurs started disappearing. I've got about a million of them before LJ started coming over. I had two million. It's kind of embarrassing how LJ got them from me. I've heard he's still one or two at a time, and I asked Byron what I should do to stop him. But I said, done sweat it, punk. The way I figure it, one or two of them stupid little monsters ain't real high price for you to pay to get someone to play with you. But LJ wasn't satisfied with doing one or two. I guess he wanted a raise. So one day he said to me, you know, we should stop having these little fights all the time. We need, um, we need to have one big great battle. Yeah, we could call it the world's greatest dinosaur war ever, I said. But I get to be the Americans. I should have known something was fishy when LJ said, okay, but I get first shot. Most of this time, it always took a big fight to decide who had to be the Nazis. I started setting up my dinosaurs, and LJ said, this ain't right. If this is really, if this really is the world's greatest dinosaur war ever, we need some more monsters. You should go get the rest of them. He was right. If this was going to be a famous battle, we needed more fighters. Okay, I'll be right back, I said. This wasn't going to be easy. I wasn't allowed to take all my dinosaurs out at once because Mama was afraid I'd lose most of them, especially because she didn't trust LJ. Every time you come over, she'd tell me, you watch out for that boy. He's a little too sneaky for my taste. I had a plan, though. I'd go upstairs and drop the pillowcase I kept my dinosaurs in out of the window. I wasn't so stupid that I dropped them down to LJ. I dropped them out the other side of the house and then run around to get them. My plan worked perfect. After I went and picked up the pillowcase, I set up my dinosaurs and LJ set up the Nazis and we started the battle. He took first shot and killed about 30 of mine with an atomic bomb. My dinosaurs shot back and got 20 of his with a hand grenade. The battle was going great. Dinosaurs were falling right, left, and center. We had a great big pile of dead dinosaurs off to the side and had to keep shaking more and more reinforcements out of the pillowcase. Then in the middle of the one big fight, LJ said, wait a minute, Kenny, there's something we forgot about. I was ready for a trick. I knew LJ was going to try to get me to go away for a minute so he could steal a bunch of my monsters. I said, what? These dinosaurs have been dropping autumn bo atomic bombs on each other. Think about how dangerous that is. How is it dangerous? LJ said, look, he made one of those brontosauruses run by the pile of the dead dinosaurs. And when it got two steps past them, it started shaking and twitching and fell on its side, dead as a donut. LJ flipped him on the dead... LJ flipped him on the dead dinosaur pile. I said, what happened to him? It was the radioactiveness. we got to bury the dead ones before they infect the rest of the live ones. Maybe it was because we had such a great war going on, I was kind of nervous about who'd win. But the stupid stuff made sense. So instead of digging each one of the couple hundred dead dinosaurs a grave, we dug one giant hole and buried all the radioactive ones in it. Then we put up a big rock on top so no radioactive could break or leak out. This really was the world's greatest dinosaur war ever. We fought and killed dinosaurs for such a long time that we had to make two more ga graves with two more big rocks on top of them. LJ finally pulled a trick I knew he was going to he was going to, but it didn't he didn't do it so cool that I didn't even see it coming. Kenny, you've ever been over in banking Larry Dunn's fort? L LJ knew I hadn't. Uh-huh. I found out where it is. Where? You want to come see it? Are you crazy? They ain't there. This is Thursday night. They're up at the community center playing ball. Really? Well, if you're too scared. I knew this was the worm with the hook in it, but I bit anyways. I'm not scared if you aren't. 
let's go. I figured the trick would come in right here, so I kept a real good eye on LJ while we put my monsters back in the pillowcase. When we were done, I sneaked a look at his back pockets because I knew when he stole dinosaurs, he put them back there or in his socks. From the way his pockets were sticking out, it looked like he had one Trinosaurus Rex and one tris <laughs> Triceratops. Sorry, guys. It's so hard with my retainer. I couldn't tell how many he had in his socks. I figured that wasn't too bad of a price as much as we had. LJ was talking a mile a minute. They even got some books with ladies in it. You ever seen a lady? Yeah, lots of times. I'll just say, you gotta be in the house by seven, don't you? Yeah. Okay, we better hurry before it gets too late. After I sneaked the dinosaurs back into the house, we ran off to our banking and Larry Dunn's secret four. It wasn't until nine o'clock at night when I was in bed that a bell went off in my head. I'd forgotten all about the radioactive dinosaurs. I put on my tennis shoes, got my night reading flashlight, climbed out of the back window, and went down to the tree in the backyard. I got to the battleground and saw the three radioactive grapes, but when I moved the rock on the first one and dug a little bit down, I didn't hit one dinosaur. Not one. The second grave was empty, too. I didn't even move the rock from the third one. I just sat there and felt real stupid. I couldn't help thinking about Sunday school again. I remembered the story about how a bunch of angels came down and rolled away the rock that was in front of Jesus' grave to let him go to heaven. I think it took them three days to push the rock far enough so he could squeeze out. My dinosaurs weren't even in their graves for three hours before someone rolled their rocks away. Maybe it was a lot easier for a bunch of angels to get a million dinosaurs to heaven than it was to get the savor of the whole world there. But I wish they'd given me a couple more hours. But I was just making excuses to myself for being so stupid. I know if a detective had looked at these rocks, he wouldn't have found a clue of a single angel being there. But I bet a million bucks that he'd have seen those rocks were covered with a ton of L.J. Jones fingerprints. I never played with L.J. again after that. So playing with Rufus got to be okay. It was a lot better not to have to worry about getting stuff stolen when you were with your friends. And it was a lot better not spending half the time arguing about who's going to be the Nazi dinosaurs. I was wrong when I said that me and Rufus being near each other all the time would make people tease both of us twice as much. People started leaving me alone and going right after Rufus. It was easy for them to do because he was kind of like me. He had two things wrong with him too. The first thing wrong with Rufus was the way he talked. After he said that hi ya y'all stuff on the bus, he got to be famous for it. And no matter how much he tried to talk in a different way, people wouldn't let him forget what he said. The other thing wrong with him was his clothes. It didn't take people too long before they counted how many pairs of pants and shirts Rufus and Cody had. That was easy to do because Rufus only had two shirts and two pairs of pants, and Cody only had three shirts and two pairs of pants. They also had one pair of blue jeans that they switched on and on. Some days Rufus wore them, some days Cody rolled the legs up and put them on. It's really funny how something as stupid as a pair of blue jeans can make you feel real, real bad. But that's what happened to me. We had been sort of secret friends for a couple of weeks before people really started getting on them about not having a bunch of clothes. Me and Rufus and Cody were on the bus right behind the driver one day when Larry Dunn walked up, walked up to our seat and said, Country cornflake, I notice how you and the little flakes switch off on the pants, and I know Fridays is your day to wear them, but I was wondering if the same person who gets to wear the pants gets to wear the drawers that day, too. Of course, the whole bus started laughing and hollering. Larry Dunn went back to his seat real quick before the driver had a chance to tell anybody the secret he knew about Larry's mama. I looked over at Cody. He had the blue jeans on today and was pulling the waist out to check out his underpants. Maybe it was because everybody else was laughing. Maybe it was because Cody had such a strange look on his face while he peeked at his underpants. Maybe it was because I was glad that Larry hadn't jumped on me. But whatever the reason was, I cracked up too. Rufus shot a look at me. His face never changed, but I knew right away I'd done something wrong. I tried to squeeze the rest of my laugh down. Things got real strange. Instead of Rufus jabbering away at me a mile a minute in school, he scooted around his seat so all I could see was his back. He didn't follow me on the playground either, and he acted like he didn't want my sandwiches anymore. Ever since Mama had met Rufus, I told her about sharing my sandwiches with him, and she'd been giving me four sandwiches and three apples for lunch. When I saw him and Cody weren't going to come under the swing at lunchtime, I set the bag with their sandwiches and apples in it on the swing set. The bag was still there when the bell rang. They quit sitting next to me on the bus, too, and Rufus didn't show up that night to play. 
After this junk went on for three or four days, I sneaked the pillow I sneaked the pillowcase full of dinosaurs out and headed over to where Rufus lived. I knocked on the door and Cody answered. I thought things might be back to being okay because Cody gave me a great smile and said, Hiya, Kenny. You want to talk to Rufus? Hi, Cody. Just a minute. Cody closed the door and went back inside. A minute later, Rufus came to the door. Hey, Rufus, I thought you might want to play dinosaurs. It's your turn to be the Americans. Rufus looked at the pillowcase and back at me. I am playing with you no more, Kenny. How come? I knew, though. I thought you was my friend. I didn't think you was like all them other people, he said. I thought you was different. He didn't say this stuff like he was mad. He just sounded real, real sad. He pulled Cody out of the doorway and shut it. Rufus might as well tied me to a tree and said, ready, aim, fire. I felt like someone had pulled all my teeth out with a pair of rusty pliers. I wanted to knock on his door and tell him, I am different, but I was too embarrassed, so I walked the dinosaurs back home. I couldn't believe how sad I got. It's funny how things could change so much and you wouldn't notice. All of a sudden, I started remembering how much I hated riding the bus. All of a sudden, I started remembering how lunchtime under the swing set alone wasn't very much fun. All of a sudden, I started remembering that before Rufus came to Flint, my only friend was the world's biggest dinosaur thief, L.J. Jones. All of a sudden, I remembered that Rufus and Cody were the only two kids in the whole school, other than Byron and Joey, that I didn't automatically look at sideways. A couple of days later, Mama asked me to sit in the kitchen with her for a while. How school? Okay. I knew she was fishing to find out what was wrong, and I hoped it wouldn't take her too long. I wanted to tell her what I'd done. Where's Rufus been? I haven't seen him lately. It was real embarrassing, but tears just started exploding out of my face, and even though I knew she was going to be disappointed in me, I told Mama I had hurt Rufus's feelings. Did you apologize? Sort of, but he wouldn't let me, t he wouldn't let me talk to him. Will you give him some time, then try again? Yes, Mama. The next day after school, when the bus pulled up at Rufus' stop, Mama was standing there. When Rufus and Cody got off, they said, Hi, Mrs. Watson, and gave her their big smiles. The three of them walked towards Rufus' house. Mama put her hand on Rufus' head while they walked. Mama didn't say anything when she got home. I didn't ask her, but I kept an eye on the clock. At exactly 5.30, there was a knock, and I knew who it was, and I knew what I had to do. Mama and Joey were in the living room, and when they heard the knock, everything got real quiet. Rufus and Cody were standing on the porch smiling a mile a minute. I said, Rufus, I'm sorry. He said, that's okay. I wasn't through, though. I really wanted him to know. I am different. He said, shoot, Kenny, you think I don't know? Why do you think I came back? But remember, you said it's my turn to be the Americans. People started moving around the living room again. I guess I should have told Mama that I really appreciated her helping me get my friend back. But I didn't have to. I was pretty sure she already knew. All right, guys, we are on chapter four now. Froze up Southern folks. Let's see. Ooh. Okay, chapter four is going to be a little bit longer. What time is it? Maybe I'll go ahead and read it. Should I go ahead and read it? Hmm. Let's see how many pages it is before I start reading. I'm just going to read it tomorrow because it's almost 20 minutes and I told you guys one chapter a day. So chapter three, we know that Kenny accidentally hurt Rufus, Rufus's feelings because he laughed with the other kids. That would hurt my feelings, too. So they made up. I want you to infer what Froze Up Southern Folks is going to be about. I'm excited. Bye, guys.